You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy, God. There is none like you. In all the earth, God, there is none like you. None faithful like you. None worthy like you. None mighty like you. None loving like you. None forgiving like you. None filled with grace and mercy like you. None steadfast. So we say that there is none like you in all the earth. No name like your name. No word like your word. Your word establishes us, God. Your word picks us up out of the miry clay and puts us on solid ground. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. The entrance of your word brings light and life. And we thank you for your word, God. We thank you that you sent your word to be made flesh. We thank you that you dwelt among us. We thank you, Emmanuel. We thank you, God, that you never left us, never forsook us, that you kept every promise. We thank you, God, that you know the plans that you have for us, the thoughts that you think towards us. Thoughts to prosper us and not to harm us. Thoughts to give us a hope in the future. And Father, we don't take that and lift ourselves up. We take that and lay it at your feet and say, let what you have for us be what we chase after. Let your desires for us be what we pursue, God. Decrease us today. Increase you. Let us know you better. Let us hear you clearer. Make the crooked things straight today, God. Establish our goings. Your word says that you would make our feet like deer's feet that we might not slip. Father, establish our path under us in your word and by your spirit in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. tell you what worship will do I told you on Wednesday that the woman in John 4 and she came to the well and Jesus was on the well and he says give me something to drink and she had all these excuses of why she couldn't do it that she was a Samaritan woman and he was a Jew and they had no dealings and that was her geopolitical standpoint that they worship on this mountain those worship on that mountain where's the right place to worship that he didn't have the right tools that her issues were too deep and his recall was still give me something to drink and then he said if you knew who was in front of you you'd ask me for something to drink God always asks us to pour out to him in his offering to pour out on us I watched boxing last night I watched the uh, Canelo Alvarez fight. He won. <laughs> My son called me to ask me who I thought was going to win, and I said, Canelo's obviously going to win. And I said, but this guy has a puncher's chance. You know what that means? That means that he's strong enough that if he land the right one, he could lose 12 rounds, but if he land the right one, he got a shot. See, this is the Samaritan woman in John 4 that her life is a mess. She's got five husbands before. The one she went ain't her own. She's a Samaritan woman that has no dealings. But she, a worshiper always has a puncher's chance. That's why we always encourage people to worship with us and to lift your hands and to lift your voice because I don't know where you was at last night, but I know where you are right now. And if you can let yesterday go and just throw your hands up 
is a puncher's chance. You will knock down every wall, break off every chain, knock the hell out of the devil. I got some scripture. Is that all? Did y'all hear that? I couldn't hear none of it. I hear everything up here but the keys. There you go. There we go. There we go, Mike. All right. It's on. We on now. I got some verses. Not many. You know what, Ricky? I'm going to read these ones I put in there. But if you would pull up Psalm 139 for me and have it ready for later on, I feel something in there too. Listen. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 says this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? When he say, if you, my people call by my name, and we now prophesied in thy name. And in thy name have cast out de devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Oh, I got the King James up here. I'm sorry, man. That's new King James. That's all right. You who practice lawlessness, you may be seated. You who work iniquity, King James says. If you um, were to read through chapters 5 through chapter 7 of Matthew, this is what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, right? And it is... Um, it is probably the, uh, one of the three of the greatest chapters because it's all Jesus teaching. And what he's teaching, is he's going from topic to topic, but it's all so interrelated. Um, and then we end, in, end up to this point in chapter 7 where he starts talking about who's going to get into the kingdom. Now, if you jump back, you'll find where he says uh, right before this, narrow is the way and straight is the gate that leads to eternal life. And he says that wide is the path that leads to destruction. So now he's talking about a narrowing that happens. There's a filtering that happens that, that, that uh, everyone who starts out ain't ending up with it. That everyone who begins is not into the proper ending. That there's a filter process, it's a, there's a funnel happening. And, and so we see a different group of people standing before him crying, Lord, Lord, than all those who started out. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and I'm sure when we're all walking through life, uh, there's all different types of life. But those who stand before him, there's none standing before him saying, let me buy my way in. That's not what they're saying. They went from, they, they're no one's no, trying to buy their way in. They're trying now to make bargains and saying, look what I've done. Look, is this good enough? Look what I've done. Because your money don't go with you. It's, 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 it, there's a, a Catholic belief. And this is why we ain't Catholic. Well, this ain't the only reason. There's many reasons. <laughs> But they have a, they, we, 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 see, we see here, they have an idea of purgatory. We don't see that here. Right. Just like the thief on the cross, Jesus said, this day you'll be with me. Yeah. Uh, there's no waiting period in purgatory for you to purge off all the things you've done wrong so then you can stand before him and say, can I come in now? Right. 
Purgatory is, is, is a false bargaining chip. Uh, they tie it to an idea called the treasury of merits. Anyone familiar with this? The treasury of merits is a, is a doctrine that they've established saying that Mary was so good and so perfect and so this and that, that she had an abundance of grace in her, that it was not all needed for her, and so it went into a treasury of merit. Therefore, it can be distributed to people who are not worthy so that they can have this grace. You get to participate in the treasury of merits as well, according to them, which is why, while your people are in purgatory, you can pay the church and do good works, and you do good merits to get them in out of the treasury of merits. This is how the Roman Catholic Church got rich. Is people will come and try to buy their family members into heaven. This is... <laughs> Somebody laughing. Jesus said early on, he said, he said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So now we see that those who think they can make exchanges for their soul, they're not in the picture anymore. Now it's those who think that they belong here. There is a narrowing that has happened here because somewhere along the way, somebody, uh, somebody got caught in the, in the wide path. Here's, here's, here's the thing about the wide path I've learned. Um, it's easy to get caught in it. I know we all think we can't. The two of us think we can. <laughs> I'm, at least I'm honest. I, I hope I can't. Um, <laughs> but what I've learned is, is between the God I've done this in your name and the I want this for me, is there, there's easy to get caught into that. Because I have learned over, uh, over my years, 43 years, I have learned that conviction has a price tag for many people. Yeah. That everyone got a standard until the price is right. Everyone heard God until the price is right. I, 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 um, the world has a saying that if money don't move you, it's only because you ain't been offered enough money yet. The devil think he can buy anything he wants to. But we see Jesus talk in Matthew 6 right before we come into this. He says, listen, don't lay up treasures uh, here in earth, but lay them up in heaven. So now he's already separating the wants of the world from the things of the kingdom. And then he goes on and he says, uh, where well, rust can get them and this and that, but you put them in, lay up your treasures in heaven, rust can't get them, moth can't eat it, this and that. Then he says, so don't worry about what you eat or drink. Which tells us then we start seeing this decline of this funnel of those who are really going to stand before him because somewhere the world's wealth turns into worry because it's connected. Uh, what I did to get it, I got to do to keep it. That's a standard understanding that what you do to get something, you got to do to keep something. That's why it's so hard to preach kingdom to people who live illicit lifestyles. Because the money they got from selling dope, they can't get working at McDonald's. And what they did to get it, they got to do to keep it. So now you're telling them, don't just come out to be saved. You're saying change occupation, but you got no other skill set that's employable. That's why a, a woman can be a dancer or a prostitute and make so much money in a week, and then you want her to come out and be a waitress. Or a nurse or whatever. I'm not going to say they, it's always good going from this to waitress, right? Like, waitress is the only option <laughs> after you're saved. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm working out an idea here. <laughs> Because, because what you do to get something, you got to do. That's why we don't do, uh, we don't go out and like, let's put bounce houses and hot dogs and do all this. Because what you do to get people, you got to do to keep people. If you came for the hot dogs, you're only here for the hot dogs. In a minute, we run out of hot dogs. We run out of you. <laughs> but these things are directly connected. And, 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 and the problem is our elders, our elders, the church's elders, it means me. Yeah. It means y'all yeah. that are elders don't want to be elders anymore. So we have to convince elders to be elders. The, the scriptures say the elders should teach the younger. Well, if our elders are chasing riches in this world, who's teaching doctrine? If our children only ever see us going after career goals, 
Who's teaching them how to go after God? And so now elders no longer want to be elders because we bought into the idea that we're supposed to be rich in everything. There's nothing wrong with being rich as long as the riches chase you. Uh, but that's not how, how we want to do things. And, 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 and now 40 is the new 30. Because elders don't want to be elders. Man turns 45, he buys a motorcycle. Leaves his wife, marries a daughter figure. Because <laughs> elders don't want to be elders anymore. There's a funnel. And that funnel goes from the why that you could do anything down to now none of that matters. And here we got to stand on who are my people who are called by my name. So now they're declaring, here's the list that they're declaring. Here's what I've done in your name. Here's what I've done in your name. Here's what I've done in your name. And none of them can say, I worked my job in your name. None of them are saying, I had a savings count in your name. None of them say, I took vacation in your name. And it's difficult. The reason the list, the list switches down and it's easy to get caught in the wide of a, of a thing is because we play with it. We like to play. I went on vacation. It wasn't really a vacation. It was a graduation Asian. It was for my children. I just got the benefit from it. Let me tell you one of the things that, 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 that happens when you're on vacation is you say things like, I could stay here forever. You could stay here forever. And you don't really mean you could stay here forever because after a certain point you say, I miss my bed. Right? You don't really want to stay in that place forever. But vacation puts up a condition. The condition is I plan to be here, so I have the funds to be here, so everything is provided and there's no stress here. That place I'd like to be forever. That's rich. That's rich when you're not rich. Right? That's what wealth is. It's, it, this is the lifestyle of the wealthy. <laughs> as, as I got up and, and, and there was food on the table already. I didn't have to cook it. I didn't have to clean it. It was there. That's what we want to bring back. That's what we say, I could do this forever. And then it makes us walk back into our regular life and disdain it. Because now we got to come on, we got to wash the dishes, right? We got to cook the food. Got to get back into a routine. We drudge the routine. We say, I need a vacation from my vacation. You rent a car. And you get in that car, man, that thing is like a spaceship. Where they get these rental cars from? It's like, it's like, it's like buttons everywhere. <laughs> Captain Kirk. <laughs> you get done with that, you turn in, you go get back in your dirty car. It's bird poop on the car. <laughs> you got to find your key because it ain't push button on this one. You got to vroom, you know, and, and you, sometimes you got to shake it to get the starter past the flywheel. <laughs> Only the mechanics know what that is. <laughs> Cup holder sticky. Dirty. <laughs> Got bacon jam in it. <laughs> Smell funny in here. French fries under the seat. <laughs> and you know, for a second you think, I should go buy a new car. Because you played in a realm yeah. 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 that you ain't called to. Yeah. That's right. That's right. This is how it works. Is that you step into the realm of the lender. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The rental car that you pay for it is a loaner. Yeah. The borrower becomes slave to the lender. Yeah, that's right. And what happens is if, if you don't understand true godly contentment, you will start chasing the fantasies you engaged in. Till it puts you in bondage to them. And we miss the important things in life. Because that's not important. I've been getting places long before I had a car. We always had a way around. I bought my first car when I was 15. 
wasn't even old enough to have a car, and I bought it. $275, 1984 Volkswagen Jetta. The guy wanted 500 but I told him how bad it was. <laughs> Tricked him. <laughs> I wrecked that car. But I, I've been getting places for a long time. Didn't have air condition, but we had 270 air. How many of y'all know 270 air? Phyllis said 470. She had four doors. She was luxurious. I had two on my car. Let's put two windows down and go 70. That's your air condition. <laughs> she had four doors. That's three more than she needed. Right? So she had a luxury vehicle. <laughs> but we get caught up in, 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 in the lifestyle, and we don't pay attention to what's important. Jesus tells us what's important here is knowing him. And he says, he, he says um, I never knew you, which is an intimate thing. Not that you didn't do stuff. I just didn't know you. You know, the, the marriage is only the marriage after the consummation. Uh, the intimacy is, is what makes him know you. Your works don't matter. It don't matter if you stamp his name on it. And this should be one of the scariest verses in the scripture because so many people try to stamp God's name on their desire, stamp God's name on their way of life, stamp God's name on their success, give God the glory, and he said, I don't even know you. you yeah, you, you might have asked for it, and then you might have walked into it, but you wasn't getting it from me. You was manifesting it, which... Now, just because you throw my name on it don't mean I'm in it. They threw Yahweh's name on the golden calf. So we, we learn in Chronicles uh, why his name is important to us. Is that if we're called by his name, if his people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then he'll hear. Right? We want him to hear us. That means we have relationship. We want him to heal us. That means, we, that means that we are in his plan and in his, his perfection. This is the way he created us, not sick and not broken and not bent over and not running from him. Yeah. Amen. 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 Somebody say pray. pray. Don't nobody like a lot of messages on prayer. So I'm going to give you one. Here's the things Jesus taught about prayer. Very quickly. He said, this is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is how you pray. He didn't say this is how you pray. I decree and declare. Right. Now, I don't have a problem with decrees and declares. For you have life and death in the power of your tongue, and those who love it eat its fruit. Feel free to decree and declare. But he taught prayer a particular way for a reason. Next thing he teaches about prayer, because he doesn't teach much about prayer, surprisingly. As he says... Could you not tarry with me one hour? So he tells his own disciples. Is an hour too much? You know, when we come out of a worship service and we cut the music for a minute and we let it go for about three minutes without the music, y'all get weary. Could you not tarry with me one hour? Did James and John and Peter have a keyboard playing for them while Jesus was up in Gethsemane? Did, were they, was he rocking them on the two and the four? Did they have a leader over there saying, come on, boys, come on. Lord, we come to lift you up, give you praise. And no, they fell asleep. He said, could you not tarry with me one hour? Where's your endurance at? How are we going to know each other if we don't spend no time together? He teaches us in the scriptures that we should ask, seek, and knock. Ask and keep asking. Yeah. Seek and keep seeking. Knock, keep knocking. He said, your father will give you the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So the purpose of this is not ask and keep asking for your stuff. Yeah. Knock and keep knocking for your things. Yeah. 
Seek and keep seeking for your future. It was for the Holy Ghost. Because the goal of prayer is knowing God because knowing God is directly connected to prayer. And you can know the Bible and not know God. You can just know about God. Prayer is directly connected to knowing God. It's communication. Because prayer is connected to his will. And his will is connected to the kingdom. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, this is what I would do. It's connected to his will. His will is connected to his kingdom. Jesus said that they're going to come to get into the kingdom. And it's not those who said, Lord, Lord, but those who did the will of my father. They're going to see the kingdom. So now we know that knowing him is connected to his will, which is connected to the kingdom. Hence, this is how you pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God's kingdom and will are connected to prayer. Somebody say prayer. Prayer. God says this very clearly. He says, if my people, <clears throat> y'all got to hear it, but it ain't online. <laughs> if my people, look at the person on your right, and if they're your people, say my people. Look at the person on the left. If they're your people, say my people. If they ain't your people, and they said my people to you, say, why are you lying? <laughs> That's just because we're in church. They don't do it just because we're in church. I'll be lying. You ain't my people. <laughs> Everybody with me ain't family. <laughs> nah, I'm just playing. Everybody with me is family. Because if you ain't family, I ain't with you. God says, my people, he's sure. He knows his people. He knows who they are. That's why he's not saying, if all people. He says, if my people, not if all people, if you look up that word people or my people in the Hebrew, it is nations or a tribe. If my tribe that is called by my name, if my nation that is called by my name, he knows his people. He ain't, all people ain't involved here. He don't even hear the prayers of the wicked. This is why he tells us, turn from your wicked ways when you pray. Um, Jesus says this is how much we know he knows his people I have not lost one of mine that was given to me he knows his people Uh, and then he says that are called by my name my people called by my name you know being called by his name is an identifier uh, being identified by his name is, is, is what qualifies you to even be in this conversation. If my people who are called by my name. Too many of us don't want to be called by his name. You know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say, if my people who secretly proclaim me as to not to offend. Humble themselves and pray. That's a word, Walker. That's a word. I had to sit down on it, man. You don't say if my people who who, who no one knows you're of me humble themselves and pray. He didn't say if my people who blend in with every way of the world. No, he says, those who are called by my name, that means, one, I am called out. That means I am distinguished and identified by his name. Not just called by him, but when you look at me, you call me by his name. You say, that's one of them. My people who are called by my name. God says, he says, my people. This is what the people said. When Jesus is talking about it, he says, the people say, Lord, Lord. They say, my God. This is my God. You're my God. He says, these are my people. The people that stand before Jesus say, you are my God. But Jesus says, I never knew you, but I know my people. That's a fight, ain't it? You're my God. No, I don't know you. And I know my people. 
He has always known his people. He says, depart from me, you who work iniquity. Somebody say work. Work. That word in the Greek means to trade in. I do trade with iniquity. I make bargains with iniquity. Uh, rob, rob a little from here and do here. And I, I, I shake it up and make it look healthy, but it ain't. Trade in. It means to toil as an occupation. That means some people is really working that thing. Some people is really working iniquity. Some are just trading in it, and some are working it like it's a job. You don't even take time off to sin. You don't even have sin vacations, right? It's sin 24-7. It means, it means to minister about, which means you're evangelizing it. See, this is, this is why people who live in sin or operate in iniquity can seem like they love you more than the church because they'll, they'll pump, pass and kick you down right into your mess. They'll say things like, just follow your heart. Why, you traitor, worker in iniquity? My heart is deceitfully wicked. My heart would have had me leave God a long time ago. My heart would have had me leave my family. My heart would have had me chase a dollar. My heart would have had me give up on everything. Follow your heart. We'll always be here for you. No, that's the, the minister in about here. Have some of this. Have some of this. Have some of this. This is whatever y'all wanted to be, y'all filthy-minded people. <laughs> this could be me carrying a box of something here. <laughs> y'all so unholy. It means to labor for. It means to be engaged in or engaged with. Iniquity simply means without law or a violation of the law, which means you labor for or you trade in. Could simply look like this. What do you vote for? I don't vote. And you ain't going to push me into ancestral worship talking about what, what my ancestors did and how I should vote. I look, this ain't Yoruba. I don't worship them. They should have sat their tail down and been content with the Lord. Somebody don't like that. They saying you ain't going to get me into nationalism. Uh, the name of the beast, uh, the image of the beast, because I was military and, and, and you ain't giving me that. We fought for this right nonsense. Because there is none of God that runs for office. And a kingdom that's not his. That's why every politician that stands in that house of representatives, (laughs) they represent a different God. They represent a different kingdom. They don't represent you, the people. They represent the oppression of the people. And we don't have to get into all of that right now. Anybody got a problem with that? See me after service. I will run you through. <laughs> I will run you through the treaties that oppress. I will run you through the laws that we are bound to and that we are nothing but chattel. Yeah. Yeah. That's what our, our papers say. But when you, the whole point of the vote ain't that you get a choice in what's done. And understand this, that the first election held in scripture was one against God's will. They voted for Saul to be king. So when we find ourselves in this, I get a say over who rules me. This is antithetical to to the ways of God. God said, I was your king. But you wanted to be like everyone else and have someone else rule over you. It is not God's will that any man would rule over you. So much so, he says, call no man father. But they get us into voting. And what do we vote for? Do we vote to love our neighbor as ourselves? No, because no one's running on that platform. No, 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 no. Who do we vote for? We either vote for capital punishment of one man or abortion of, a, of another. There's no platform that you align yourself with that aligns itself with Scripture. You, 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 you either vote... To, to, to separate tax brackets widely, or you vote 
to call someone with a penis a woman. You think you're voting for a name. No, you are trading in iniquity. You are working to legalize what is against Torah. You are a worker of iniquity. Torah say one thing. These are practices we set examples of. We minister about, we work it like a job, which is why there's a wage. For the wages of sin is death because you worked iniquity. It says, it says to be engaged in or engaged to. I love this because I had to look up the difference between being betrothed and being engaged. Because they're very similar, just two different systems. The world says engaged, the kingdom says betrothed. The word betrothal means truth or a pledge. Um, it's often used interchangeably with people. However, um, the betrothal often is an agreement between families. Like an arranged marriage. You see, see when, when the father made us a co-heir, this is an arranged marriage yes, yes, yes. between man, the families of the earth, yes. and him. This is an arranged marriage. That means you don't get a say-so. This is the groom. Engagement is different. I get to decide if I want to, who I want to, what I want to pursue. One is an agreement amongst families, therefore it's a covenant. The other one is, some, is, is an event I have, I'm going to an engagement. That's not even the wedding. I mean, not even the marriage. It's just the wedding. It's the engagement I've committed to, not the intimacy. And when people deal with the engagement and not the intimacy, they stand before God that they say, you're my God, and he says, I don't know you. How well does he know you? How well does he know me? Let me just read you a portion of the scripture. Yes. Psalm 139. Yes. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's too wonderful for me. Yes. Cheryl, it's too yes. wonderful for me. Yes, but I'm going to start at verse 7. Yes. I quote this often. But I'm going to start here. Where can I go yes. from your spirit? Yes. Let me paraphrase that. Yes. You see everything. Yes. You have seen it all. My lowest lows, my highest highs, my, 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 my deepest sighs and sorrows and my, my most boisterous cries. You have, you've seen it all. Because I can't get away from you. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? You know this presence, this word presence in the Hebrew. It's the same word when he says, if my people who are called by my name. Uh, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Yes. That word face is this word presence. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I go from your face? Where can I go that you don't see me? Where can I go that you're not with me? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Never leave you or forsake you. Made my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. If I say, see, see this, and your right hand shall hold me. This is, this is, now this is a whole different discussion. We ain't got to get into it. But when they say Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Who is he telling? You can't get away from the Spirit because even Jesus is there then. This is the oneness of God. All right, hold on, where was I at? And your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me. Surely the darkness shall cover me. Surely darkness means the destruction, the brokenness, the bruising, and the bondage. That's what it means in the Hebrew. If my destruction, if my brokenness, if my bruising shall cover me. That means that I'm covered in my mess. 
covered in my bondage. It says, even the night shall be like light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. Not that darkness is hiding from you. The darkness can't hide you from him. The darkness shall not hide from you. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you, excuse me, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Get this. If the darkness covers me, it can't hide me because you already covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. This is why you can't fool me with no atheist talk because your soul knows full well that the invisible attributes of God are made known to man. So man is without excuse that you can try to play ignorant, but something deep inside always cries out. Get into a car wreck, they scream out, oh God. Get sick, they say, God help me. Because something inside says there's more that before I tried to cover myself in the darkness of atheism, the darkness of witchcraft, you formed me in my mother's womb and you cover me and my soul knows it. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret. That's, that's why if you're a boy, he gave you the boy's frame, you're a boy. It wasn't hidden from him. You ain't tricking him. Little lady boys out here. And skillfully, wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance. Now, let me just stop right here. Let me pause right here. Faith didn't start with us. We have faith because we're made in his image. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Before we were here, here's what it says. It says, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. God saw the substance before it was there. Before it was seen, he saw it. He made it by his word. That's why we walk in faith and not in sight because we're walking after his likeness. That's good to me, Patrick. And in your book, they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. I was talking to Francis one day in my living room, and I said, I said, you know, script, scriptures say that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen. I said, but when you look around, weapons are prospering. I said, maybe one day I'll preach it. I don't know. I said, but, but this scripture of no weapon formed against you is not dealing with the you that you've decided to be. Amen. The you that you have decided to be has yielded yourself to the weapons of the enemy. When you chase his money, you chase his hand. When you chase his hand, you can be hugged or slapped, and those weapons will, war, will win against you. But there is a you that you do not know, that he formed in the secret place, that he saw full well before any day came to be. That version of you that he covered, that version of you that can't get away from him, that version of you, that no weapon that is formed will prosper against it. Why? Because when you try to cover that you in darkness, his hand still leads you. You try to cover that you, you try to bury that you in your regret try to bury that you in your guilt but his right hand still held you that's why when the shaking happens all of that other you falls off only what he has built sustains now if you can get yourself down into being happy with the you that he's called you to be submit it as the you that he's made you to be then the weapons don't matter no more The enemy don't shoot at what he can't hit. He didn't put no effort into going after Job. He said there's a hedge around him. Why would I even try? This is what he has declared you to be. Darkness can't hide you. It can't cover you. Wickedness can't break you away from him. This is how much he knows his people. So what the enemy does... As he tries to contract you, 
talked about this on Wednesday. The word contract, this is your marriage contract. That's what he wants. He wants it done by the state, not done by the covenant of the kingdom. He don't want the betrothal. He wants the engagement. Contract, I told you on Wednesday, means a narrowing or a small space. It means to bring you out of the vastness into a small space. Um, from the vast tract to a narrow space. This is how the enemy tries to fight us. Let me explain something to you about fighting. When you're boxing in a boxing ring, there's a term and a skill called cutting off the ring. Because it's a 20 by 20 ring, which means the guy can run around the whole thing and you're chasing him around the ring. So you got to learn to cut the ring off, how to walk in such a way that he has nowhere to go. Okay? That's narrowing the space. Come out of the boxing ring, let's go into real world fighting. Um, I had a house in Georgia. The way the house was built, follow me. When you look at the front, you see the garage. Then there's a doorway. And then there is a, um, the front side of the, which is the first bedroom, right? So it was really small looking. It was longer than it was wide, okay? So you had, you had this garage that came out this far, this bedroom that when you went in, you went and it came out, so it came out this. So now there's a walkway to the door, all right? Brick front. Only could afford the front. Uh, siding on the, on, the, on the rest of it. <laughs> if you drive by real fast, you think it's brick. If you drive by slow, you look between the houses, you know I'm, I'm, I'm fronting. That's why they call it fronting. <laughs> and and there's, a, there's, a, there's a long doorway now. Out in the yard, you might can take me. Might can take me. Especially if you're big. And you get a hold of me. But in that narrow space, I have took every advantage you have. No matter how big you are, you can't swing the same. No matter how big you are, you got nowhere to go. I have just made you small. And now that I have brought, it don't matter if you got 10 guys with you. Coming in that little walkway, y'all going to get hit one at a time. You can't surround me, you can't jump me, you can't swing wildly, it's hard to kick, it's hard to stomp, and I'm smaller so I can go up under you, lift you, drop you. Y'all saw the movie 300. 300 guys, the whole concept was to bait these guys into a narrow fighting space because you lose your advantage. This is what the enemy does with contracts. Is he takes us out of the bigness of God. And out of the bigness of the promise, and out of the bigness of our weaponry, yeah. and brings us into a narrow space to where we definitely could win out there. Yeah. But in here, he has limited our ability. Wow. Say what you mean. What you mean? Uh, this is how you try to do it with Jesus. If you worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. But Jesus had the whole kingdom. Right. He tried to bargain him into this narrow space of earthly wealth. Here's how he gets us with contracts. Fear. Fear brings us into a narrow space. So we fight differently. You won't go after things you're scared to do. Fear of failure. Fear of man. Fear of rejection. Uh, fear of loss. You won't, you won't even try. And so now the, the spirit that God gave you of power and of, of a sound mind and of love Love waxes cold, power gets small, and you start worrying all the time. So you fight differently. You whine about things you should pray about. You complain about things you should praise for. You argue with people that you should befriend. You step on the backs of people you're supposed to do the work with. Because you've been brought into a narrow space via contract. Right? We, we sign contracts with the enemy, knowing it or not, because we're not paying attention when we start worrying. That's why Jesus said, don't worry. Because now if I'm worrying, I'm not worshiping. Let that work. You get pulled into a small space. Because you know how small the space is that you're worrying about? How 
in this large, grand world we live in, have you limited your life to that one small thing you're constantly thinking about? How, how, does, how do we go from thinking of eternity with him to thinking of the money in these few years we could have? What's so-and-so going to say about us if we don't do this, if we don't get that? Pride is a contract that brings us into a narrow space. Because if we're not humble, we're not praying. And we're almost close to a fall already. So thinking more of myself, how do I go from all of the greatness of God and everything declaring his glory to me talking about my glory? That's a small space to live in. How small is my glory? <laughs> and when I, when I break down my glory, I get insecure even though I'm playing proud. How can you be proud and insecure at the same time? Because you're a liar. Because the devil was a liar and pride was found in him. So, 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 so arrogantly build yourself up, but you hate your own smile. You hate your body type. Uh, you hate your clothes and the way they fit your body. But you walk around like everyone's supposed to bow to you. Hate your job, wish you made more money, all of this stuff, but, but you walk around like you made all the money. Like you print the money. Pride. Everyone owe you an apology. You owe no one one. Brings you into a narrow space because Jesus said this is how you pray. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Brings us into a narrow space. Out of the vastness of God. Relationships take us out of the kingdom. It's, it's, it's a wild idea that people will leave the altar for a friend. That's a, that's a very polite way of saying it. Um, but, but I've said this many times. You invite your friends here, they never come. They invite you there, you're always there. They don't come because they know if they come too much, this going to become home to them. You ain't wise enough to know that if you go too much, that's going to become home to you. Narrow space. Seeing people in love with God until they was in love with a man. In love with God until they was in love with a woman. Now the next time they're going to see the altar is when they, if they, get married. But it ain't going to be the altar that they left because they're too embarrassed to stand before the one they called pastor and the ones they worship with that they said, these are my people. So their altar will be with some hireling. You know, there's websites you can go to have pastors do your weddings. Somebody said I should get on there. I said, I don't do weddings for people I don't know. I refuse. It is an honor to be a part of someone's life. And you won't narrow the greatness of a marriage that how Christ loved the church. So a husband loves his wife into some money grab. Depression narrows. Because it makes you focus on everything you think ain't right. This ain't going to never get better. How? Remember all the things that got better? Remember all the things you thought would never change. Then you went to bed and woke up and it was different. Without your effort, without your prayer, without you even thinking about it. It changed without you. Now you get narrowed into it ain't never going to change. Only thing that has never changed is God. Lucifer changed. You are the great anointed cherub over the throne room. Now look at you. They have all changed. The only one who has not changed, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is God. Now when you take that greatness and narrow it down to your little thing, you fight different. How do you give your thing the glory of God? 
something that never changes, that is a glorious testimony. If you're married and things get bad for you, one of the first things you say to your spouse is you have changed. Why have you changed? And you will hope, you would think that it's a better version of them that loved you like they loved you the first day now. So if they never changed, that's glory. That means they're in a perfected state. The only one who has that glory is God. How could you take that glory and put it on your small thing and make it a negative? This is the contract. Say contract. contract. Small space. Small. And he goes from, he wants to take you from being a son of God to a sinner. And we use it in Christian dialect. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, I'm a son of God. I'm an heir of God, a co-heir with Christ. You can be that if you want to, but you're not going to narrow me down into this undeserving place that says that I am justified in him. I am made innocent in him. I'm not not guilty because I can be found not guilty and still have done the crime. This ain't about not guilty. This is about being made innocent. God ain't adjudicating my sin. He is casting it as far from me as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more. So you're not going to nail me down into that I forgive you, but I never forget. No, I'm, I want to be like him. He said I remember it no more. The only way he maintains all these relationships is to forgive it and forget it. The reason why you don't have none is because you might forgive it, but you ain't going to forget none of it. Therefore, you still walk away from the people that you tried to say you reconciled with. A prodigal son to slave, from son to slave. The prodigal son says, I'll be a servant in my father's house. He didn't, he didn't raise you to be a slave. He didn't create you to be a slave. When he saw your body while it was yet unformed, he didn't put chains on it. Spirit, we receive, the scripture says, there's not one that puts us into bondage to fear again. This is why when the prodigal son comes home, the first thing the father offers him is a coat because he covered him in his mother's womb. But he wants to bring us from heir to slave. He wants to bring us uh, uh, to this, this small place, uh, smaller than how God made you. Get you out the spirit and back into your flesh. Get you from the bride and back into the harlot. Get you out of faith and back into your work. Because then you can change everything even if it looked the same. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Do you know why? So that you can spend time with him. The Sabbath is so you can enter into his rest. He created everything on six days and he finished his work and he rested on the seventh. Therefore, Paul tells us that it, when we want to uh, rest, we have to enter into his rest. This is the purpose of the Sabbath. Hence, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God didn't need you to rest. You needed him to rest. So he created a day for you. The problem with the Sabbath and it has happened in the Bible, and it happens now, is we have taken it from faith to work. Which is why when Jesus heals this woman on the Sabbath, they say, he sinned. And he looked back at them, because he's a Jew, right? It's from, the, it's from the tribe of Judah. It was all built on him. He said, hold on, I know the law. And it is lawful for you to take your donkeys to get water. Or if one falls in a ditch, you're going you to get him out. That's not against the, the Sabbath. Right. Then how come this lady, this daughter, right. deserves to be bent over like this and not helped? Yeah. This is how he deals with it. They were saying, you're doing work, therefore your heart's wrong. Wow. They took it off of faith and put it into work. And this is what we have turned Sabbath into. Um, uh, most Christians don't even keep Sabbath. Okay. And, you may, and, and by, 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 by calendar Sabbath, that's what, Friday at sunset to Saturday at sunset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if Sabbath is made for you and not you for the Sabbath, let's say you took Sabbath on Monday okay. and kept it holy. Okay. Fine. Yeah. But most don't. 
They get one off day a week, and they make sure that they get their car washed, their grass cut, they this, that, they da 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 da. Put that music on, crack that cold billy. They still call it, that's what Sean P used to call it. <laughs> she is from, she from, from Georgia, so she know what that is. <laughs> Turn that music up loud, jam around the house cleaning, so your mind ain't on God. A lot of people say I get one day off of work, off of, off of work per week, so I'm not going to church, I'm going to the lake. <laughs> to, this, to the beach. This is Florida, but I'm from Ohio. <laughs> We're going to the lake, <laughs> Lake Erie, Craig Beach, which is just uh, Lake uh, Milton, or uh, over there, West Branch, <laughs> the dirtiest beach you ever see. It is dirty. It's like swimming in mud. We used to think that was the beach. This. See, so you know I'm right. Shoot. Dad's got a fight with my aunt last time he was out there. <laughs> God rest his soul. <laughs> She did. <laughs> Hope my dad ain't watching this. He'll be mad that I said it so casually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Aunt Jackie. Who asked it? <laughs> Tria won't tell everybody the name. It was, that, it was Aunt Jackie. <laughs> um, Cause you ain't gonna tell Des what to do, and not and not on no dirty beach. <laughs> hey, hey, you, gotta, you gonna try to boss her around? You gotta be in a better atmosphere than that. <laughs> you, better, you better watch yourself. All right, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Sabbath. The Sabbath is not a physical thing. Not just physical rest. You could take the day off and just sit around your house and, and all of this stuff. Like even the, the modern day Jewish uh, following of it is that they don't do any labor. They won't even turn the light switches on in the house. They have to set it all up so that they walking in it the way it is. I had people come down and knock on my door to get my boys to come help them load the stroller into their car because they weren't allowed to pick it up. That's crazy. Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. Well, yeah, but you got that stroller in that car. <laughs> you are out of here. You are out of here. <laughs> Go to hell. <laughs> Immediately, straightway. <laughs> I told you why it was the path to destruction. And they pushing strollers down that path. This is not what the Bible says anywhere. The Bible don't say that. If you're here for the first time, I just wrapped about four messages into one joke. <laughs> okay. That was marvelous. It's not just physical. It's not just sitting down. If your heart ain't stayed on him, you ain't kept Sabbath. You did work, but you had no faith. And God makes this distinction. Jesus talks about all things having more to do with the condition of the heart than what you actually think. That's so why when you give, the condition of your heart matters. Yeah. Don't give begrudgingly. For the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Because it matters in the heart. That's why if you ain't giving cheerfully, just, I mean, just put it in the basket. Just don't expect the Lord to do nothing from you. <laughs> but I mean, hey, I'm not God, and we will take your begrudging gift. But he says this about the heart. He says about, about, about women, he says, uh, not just committing adultery with her physically, but if you look at her lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. That if you are angry with your brother without cause, you have committed murder. These are issues of the heart. Because, but the enemy wants to bring you out of understanding how important your heart is and think that just because you didn't do a thing, you're safe just because you can say I'm a good man or I'm a good woman or I do this. But where is your heart? The scripture says that, that one man says eat, 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 but he's counting the cost the whole time you eat. It says that, that he says this, but his heart is far from you. 
says, as a man thinks in his heart then, that's who he is. That he's telling you to eat, but he's counting the cost. The one, it's not the gracious host that he is that you think he is. He's the miser and the scrooge that God sees he is. Even though he gave it away. So it deals with the heart because it deals with knowing God. And this is why we pray. You know how we should pray? Our prayers even get off into the wrong thing because we don't have to pray about our stuff. This is tough because people love to whine to God and call it prayer. Love to beg God for stuff and call it prayer. Love to give God a list of to-dos and call it prayer. Love to give God a list of wants and call it prayer. And this is not what Jesus taught about prayer at all. Uh, the prayer, we're supposed to pray the kingdom of God, not the earth or man's needs. This is what he teaches us. You know why he teaches us this? Matthew 6 says that he already knows you have need of these things. He does it for the birds and they don't pray. He does it for the lilies and they don't pray. Your father in heaven already knows you have need of it. How much prayer time is wasted on the things God already knows we have need of? He knows you have to eat. He knows you have a bill. He knows. He already knows you have need of that. So Jesus goes on to say, seek first the kingdom. So we got to see the earth through the kingdom and stop seeing the kingdom through the earth. We, we look at the kingdom through the filter of the earth as if the cabinets of the kingdom are bare, as if the kingdom is running on a low economy or the king is unsure of where his servants are. And like, we have to remind him because the earth is, is struggling like the kingdom is struggling. No, if we look at the earth through the kingdom, then we understand we're all right. Yes. Amen. We got to see your life through him. Instead of filtering him through your life. God is not the filter of your bad choices. Your heartbreak, God, God, that ain't God. You chose that fool. You believe that liar. You slept with him without covenant. You took that job against all sound wisdom, against all instruction, and against what your soul knows about God in the beginning. You hung with friends your parents warned you about. Skip class. You, you buried yourself into rebellion, and now you see God through your failings. God's not a good God. God let this happen. God didn't let it happen. You let it happen. The way you snuck out your parents' windows, you tried to sneak out the windows of the kingdom and get back in. But the scripture said if you come through any other way, you're a thief and a liar. So you should have known who you was yielded to originally. Um, Pastor Marcus said on, 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 on Sunday, last Sunday when he was visiting, he said, God gives you more than enough. Somebody say amen. amen. Scriptures say God will give you exceeding abundantly above all you could ask a thing. Somebody say amen. amen. Now look at somebody on your left and say define that. You see, this is, this is where an objective word becomes subjective. More than enough means different things to different people. So now we have to define what more than enough. Because more than enough for someone who, who lives in a two-bedroom, one-bath flat is not the same as more than enough for someone who has a six-bedroom house. More than enough then has a scale. Oh, but the word, the word is a fixed thing. So then what is more than enough? Because it can't be based on your pay grade. It can't be based on your wants and desires. More than enough can't be based on what they tricked you to chase. You got to define what is enough and what's more than that then. <laughs> you got to define 
what is abundant, and then what exceeds that. I'm not going to find it for you here today. But oftentimes, we say more than enough as a justification for our gluttony, as a justification for our lust. We say things like exceeding abundantly because we got a, a, a prayer vision board of something we're chasing that has nothing to do with the kingdom. But God never promised to finance your mistress. Jesus taught it which way? Which way did he teach it? This is how he taught it. If you delight in the Lord, he's going to appoint desire to your heart. Now, based on that appointed desire, it is enough. So what's more than that? Jesus, through scripture, teaches us that the Lord is our shepherd. And we shall not lack then. Which means not being in lack is all that we have, have, to, have to have to not lack. Right? So if you lack nothing because God is your shepherd, then more than enough is all that you already have. Hence, godly contentment is important. Because I don't lack nothing. Let me tell you something. My mind and heart is stayed on him. It's in perfect peace. Then what do I lack? I'm overweight. I know y'all can't tell. It's the shirt. The cut of the shirt's hiding it. But I promise you, I ain't got no six pack under here. You know what that means? I got more than enough. It means I ate more than enough multiple times. It means I had enough time to sit down and not exercise more than enough time. I had more than enough. And we don't like to look at it like that because that puts us in a position to say, hold on, why are you overeating? Why are you, why are you overdoing exuberantly what God said and then holding him accountable for more? Oh, God, all this food that I have been eating, it, it is not enough. I need to eat better food at better places for better prices. So that I can call that more than enough. <laughs> uh, but if I seek him, more is added. I'm glad that I don't have any lack, therefore what I have already is more than enough. But if I seek him, more than that is added. Hence, there's more than enough and it exceeds. You take someone from abundance to lack in their thinking, not in their wallet. This is why millionaires always feel like they don't have enough money. How can you be a millionaire and have a lack mentality? And they're worried about losing it all the time, so they got to guard it all. This is, the, this is the poverty mentality of a millionaire. And, 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 and they never feel like they have enough. Now, they have more than you. They got more than me. Y'all better just say amen or I'm going to know who millionaire is hiding it in here. Somebody they out there like this. Let's pass the plate. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> uh, Jesus. Um, I ain't got more. <laughs> pass the plate. <laughs> that was good. That was good. All right, I'm about done. Somebody said double entendre. Like, I Kendrick Lamar that, right? Pass the plate, overeating more than enough. You like that? Who said double entendre? Hip hop heads in the back. <laughs> Let me get the keys up here. Keys only. I know y'all don't, I know y'all don't want me to quit. But I often listen to y'all say don't quit, and then I gotta quit and wake y'all up to give the offer. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna flow up out of this thing, and if you want more, listen to it again later. Millionaires, millionaires don't look at me, and they don't look at you. They have more than us, so they don't look at us to qualify their success. Or they'd be contempt. They look at the people who have more and determine they don't have enough. 
This is, this is why you take people from, you can take them from abundance to lack in their mentality. And you could take people from lack to abundance in their mentality. Because if I don't need it, I ain't slave to it. Don't mean I can't have it. It just means it don't own me. I ain't chasing it. And God's going to add it to me. And I'm going to praise him. And as he gives it to me, I'm going to give it away in bucket loads. And it's going to keep coming back because the harvest is going to overtake the sowing. You find yourself, then, then, then no matter what you have, you're thankful for it. It's more than enough. I got three cars. That's more than enough. One of them don't work, but it can. It's more than enough. It really can. Pastor Eric, I need you to send a flatbed over to the house. Pick up that SI. All right. Jesus taught it which way? This is how he taught it. By praying. Give us this day. Our daily bread. Let me tell you something. You pray for more than that, you ain't doing what Jesus said. Give us this day. Our daily bread. When you ask for so much more than that, the book of Proverbs tells of a man who in his prayer, he says, Lord, he says, just give me what I need. Not too much and not too little. For if I don't have enough, I may steal. But if I have too much, I may not give you the glory. So just give me what I need. Jesus teaches us of daily bread well before here when Israel is walking through uh, the desert and he gives them their manna. He says, leave none till the morning. It turns mold in their, in their mouth if they try to hold it because all you need is your daily bread. And he set Israel coming out of Egypt with clothing that would not wear out. And he didn't send them on shopping sprees through Babylon and keep them in the hottest and this and that. What they had lasted. So they didn't even need clothes. So if they got clothes, it was more than enough. Sent them with gold that they had nowhere to spend it because God provided for them. So everything they had, it just lasted. You don't need to make more. You just need what you made to be more. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread is more than enough for me. He says, therefore, whoever hears these words and does them, this is what he says right after the verses we read, I liken him to a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. That's why if you hear these words and do them, who built it? You built it on the rock. Floods are going to come, storms are going to uh, rise, and winds are going to blow, and the house is going to stand. Those who hear these words and don't do them, understand, both parties heard the word. Both parties had the same teacher, but not the same builder. And so some stood before him and said, my God, and he said, my people. But some stood before him and said, Lord, Lord, and he said, I don't know you. Why? We didn't spend no time together. You know, if you spend time with him in prayer, you do the things he said? Because it's hard to come back to him after being disobedient and sit there like you did it. Got to go, got to go look him in his face again. What do you mean look at his face? My people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. I got to come seek your face again and stand there in your presence knowing I just disobeyed you again. And not for sin's sake, for purpose sake. That you sent me with a word and I sat on it. That you sent me to repent and I was too prideful. That you sent me to be humble over here and I exalted myself. Now I got to come back and you know what? You didn't reject me when I came back. You said to seek you you would hear me and you would heal me so if I come back enough eventually I go and make the changes he told me to in order to stay unchanged I gotta stay away from him this is why Adam hid himself behind the tree but 
but his promise breaks all contracts. Y'all know that? I love how he comes to break it all. The scripture tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, if I'm not mistaken, that Moses was a mediator. But uh, that, that he gave the law. The law was given, um, it says, through the angels into the hands of men. And Moses was a mediator. And it says, God not needing a mediator. Because God is one. This is what it says. Because one does not need a mediator. So Moses was made a mediator between two, God and Israel. With the temporary contract of the law. That's, that's my language because the word contract ain't in the Bible nowhere. But that the law was a temporary contract until the promise came. Now the promise brings life. It widens up the narrowness of the law of sin and death. Because his promise breaks all contracts. I love, I love it. I always talk about how he, how he met um, the thief on the cross, on the tree, the same way God met Adam as a thief behind the tree in the garden. I never really elaborate how he catches Mary Magdalene crying at the tomb. And he says, what are you crying for? And she, supposing he was a gardener, starts talking to him until she realizes who it is. It's funny, he presented himself like a gardener or showed up like a gardener because when he made Adam and Eve, he took them and placed them in a garden of trees that he had planted. So now, at the place of the promise that your seed will crush the seed of the enemy, walks the seed as a gardener to a woman that was oppressed with seven demons to a woman that had a reputation for failure that he comes and breaks the contracts of the whole world with her you know what real prayer is real prayer ain't telling God what you need real prayer is reminding God what he has already said Real prayer is not me saying, God, let me tell you all these things that I don't have. The word pray there in the Hebrew actually means to judge. It means to intercede and make supplication, to entreat, which means I am judging a thing by the word of God. I am entreating on a thing by the word of God. So when I go before him, I look at something and I say, God, you said, you said we have dominion. You said no weapon formed. You said that you would make this happen. You said that if your people called your name, you said if I lift you up, you draw them. God, draw them according to your word. Let me tell you something. My wife can never, never convince me of anything more than when she's reminding me of what I said. She can come to me and she can say, baby, we need, we need, we need, we need, we need. And I can be like, no, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. Or she can come to me and say, hey, babe, remember when you said you wanted to get this thing so we wouldn't have this issue? Okay, let's go get it. And too many of us go before God without declaring to him his promises, his word. He gave us his word. He gave us his promise. His word dwelt among us. His word put on flesh. Heaven and earth going to pass away, but his word going to do it forever. So if I really want to make a judgment, if I really want to make a treaty, if I really want to intercede or bring all of my things to him, I got to remind him what his word says because it breaks all contracts. So when it comes down to fear, let me break the contract. God, your word says, be anxious for nothing. But in all things with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, we should make our requests known to you and your peace that passes all understanding will guard my heart and mind. Your word declares the spirit you gave me is not one of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. Your word declares that the spirit that you gave me is not one that put me into bondage to fear, but the a spirit of adoption I cry out Abba my father in heaven hallowed be your name 
and you said that I'm an heir of you and a co-heir of Christ it breaks the contract of worry so I can lay all of my things down at your feet you told me to come to you and cast every care and every sin that so easily besets me so here it is today it breaks the contracts of pride because he says if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves you know what the word humble means to bend the knee if you will bow down if you will bend the knee if you will get off of your own throne and let him plant his banner jehovah nisi over your home if you it will break all pride relationships destroyed when the promise comes those contracts John 4, that woman had one husband, wasn't hers, and five before that. And he broke every soul tie when the perfect husband stepped to the bride because that's what the promise does. Depression, let me remind you, God, who I am so you can break this contract. You said beauty for ashes. You said, not me, the oil of gladness for mourning. So restore the joy of my salvation. You said to put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So right now I declare, God, that you are good. There's none like you. That you are strong and mighty and mighty in battle. That you are holy. That your throne be lifted up. I exalt you. God, break every darkness and heaviness. For you said if it fell on me, it couldn't hide from you. So I come to you. He says, come to me all who are weary and, and heavy laden and I will give you rest. God, it is your promise to give me rest. I'm not asking for rest because I'm tired. I'm reminding you that rest was your promise. I'm reminding you that, that, that liberation was your promise. I'm reminding you that being in perfect health is your promise. I'm reminding you. You didn't promise me a million. But you promised me to prosper. He said, if my people, not all people, if my tribe, my nation, my church, my group that bears my name, that is called by my name, that is identified by my name, that the name of Jesus reigns in your life, that he is Lord and Savior, that he is on the throne high and lifted up, that when people see you, they see him. When they hear you, they hear him. When they're not even talking to you, they know you are one of those. One of those who? One of those peculiar people. One of those that belong to him. One of those that have been called out of my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and bend the knee and entreat and make judgments before me and intercede. He says, and seek my presence. Stop trying to have the word without his presence. Stop trying to have your things and not his presence. Seek my face. Then, then I'll hear. Then I'll heal them and heal their land. Your land gets healed when you know him your land is healed when you seek him Father we thank you for who you are we are your people we bear your name and God we bend the knee today we humble ourselves today we repent, God, for any time we try to sneak into your throne. Any time we try to be like you instead of being an heir of you. You are God alone and there is no God beside you. Not even us in our own lives. So we bend the knee. And your word declares if we submit to you and resist the enemy, he must flee. So we ask for your presence. We ask for your face. David said, don't hide your face from me. Father, don't hide your face from us. And we ask right now, God, that from this moment forward and every moment that we spend with you, that there be an open heaven from our mouth to your ear, that you would hear us and that you would heal us. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. I meant to say, and it came back to me in prayer, that one of the reasons that the devil tries to tell Adam and Eve you can be like God is to get you to take that throne because in a world like ours, we understand that it's the opposites that attract. That God made us in a perfect way to plug into him. But if we think that we are him or like him, there is a natural repelling or pushing away, which is why when Adam saw it, the first thing he did was run from the presence of God. It's like two magnets with the sameness. I don't want to be like God. I'm an heir of God. I'm a son of God. I don't want his throne. I want what he has for me. He knows all my days before any day came to me. And I won't build a throne here. When you came in, you received an envelope. The envelope says tithe and offering. I love the offering for so many reasons. One, it's where we get to submit to God. And two, it's where we get to come off of our own throne. Because we work for money. For the money we need. For the money we want. For the things we want. And the offering, the tithe, is a time for us to come off of our throne because it is worship. It is a bending of the knee. We know here that giving is worship. So if you need an envelope, you can slip your hand up. The ushers are there. There's also digital ways on the screen. If you're watching online, it's in the chat. It is easy, but it is holy. It is convenient, but not casual. Don't follow your notifications. It will rabbit hole you out of worship and into updates. I'm going to warn you about your updates, your current updates that are happening with, right before we give. Y'all following all this culture, pop culture stuff? And as this pop culture stuff happens, depending on whatever your timeline is or your algorithm, they flood your timeline with a bunch of stuff. You got to be aware of the spell casting that's going on. That's why I'm talking about notifications right now when it's a time of holiness. There's been an ongoing back and forth rap battle between Drake and Kendrick Lamar, and for those who know. I just want to show you how spell casting goes. Kendrick Lamar released an, a, a song called 616 in LA. Are y'all familiar with 616? There's a lot of TikTok videos that go around talking about people's birthdays and all this nonsense. Let me tell you what it really is. This is why you'll see this in Marvel, is they have this multiverse and there's always Earth 616, okay? Because in some of these scrolls that were translated for our text, in one of them there's a smudge in the interpretation, a smudge in the writing, and some early translators translated 666 into 616. So there is a, 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 an awareness that some call the mark of the beast 616 as much as 666. Marvel would never get away with saying Earth 666, but they can pass 616 off on you, and you never pay attention to it. So there are believers that 616 is the mark of the beast. Kendrick Lamar puts out this album, 616 in LA, or in the Angels, Los Angeles. 666 in the Angels. As a song about Drake, which means dragon. You think you're just listening to rap music, but the witches are at work. So when I say don't get pulled off into your notifications, you get pulled off into something so slight that you think is nothing and it is a spell. And if you think that they're doing it on accident, well, God bless you. <laughs> Be blissful. Father, we thank you for the privilege to give to your kingdom. And we thank you for the ability to be clear and focused on you. Breaking all distractions, God, we can say we're doing this for your face and for your word. 
We want this offering, this tithe, God, to be received by you from a place of a healthy heart. And we're doing this because we love you and we worship you and we adore you because we enthrone you. We serve you alone. We want to be faithful to you and not mammon. We want to be loyal to you and despise the things that would have us compete with you. So, Father, I pray for every giver that you would pour out on them exceeding abundant. I pray that, pray that you meet all the needs in their family, in their finances, and their health. I pray that you give them peace in their mind because their mind was stayed on you in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.